Today, Mendes has published a press release in regards to the ASH 2024 conference where they were able to present, uh, present clinical results in regards to their advanced two study. Standing beside me is Erik Mantig, who is CEO. Welcome. Hi, Mark. Good to see you. Mm -hmm. If you could begin by giving us some context in regards to the advanced two study, uh, the results that you were able to present, but also the study itself and, uh, and how it was carried out. Absolutely. I think what uh, um, st stands out in the update we provided is that we've treated um, patients with acute myeloid leukemia, which is a, a very aggressive blood-borne tumor, um, in this trial. It was a phase two trial. Um, following a successful phase one trial, the next step is phase two. It's slightly bigger. In this case, we also defined a specific uh, setting for the trial, and the specific setting is what we call maintenance therapy. It means that uh, acute myeloid leukemia is a very aggressive uh, blood-borne tumor. You have to immediately treat it with chemotherapy, uh, but then the disease comes back very quickly. As soon as the chemo is finished, uh, some patients already within weeks to a few months are already sick again. And that is particularly related to what's called measurable residual disease. So there are some residual cancer cells and they actually lead to the disease coming back almost immediately. That is the patient population we treated. So all of these patients had undergone initial chemotherapy uh, but they were still MRD positive, so they had residual cancer cells. That makes them a high-risk patient category. Those are the patients we treated with our product, Vididencel. It was a monotherapy trial, so we, uh, we only applied Vididencel, and there was no control arm. And the reason was, the moment we started the trial, there was no treatment for this kind of patients. So it was called watchful waiting, basically. Um, and also the relapse rates, so the rates in which people got sick, were very high. So it was actually quite a big challenge uh, for doctors, for patients, but also for us as a company to see can we, can we make a difference here. And the interesting part was, and also in the context of the update at ASH, we treated 20 patients, uh, monotherapy. We saw initial six patients uh, relapse and then uh, we saw a completely different picture. So 14 patients were alive at the end of the trial. 13 patients were still alive uh, at the last update we provided at ASH, and that is at 41.8 months, so almost 42 months uh, follow-up. And that is a remarkable finding, because uh, typically what you see with patients that are MRD positive with AML is that the relapse is very fast. And this wasn't only slowing down the relapse, we actually saw a relatively large group, the majority of patients, staying alive over many years. So all of these patients have now passed the three years um, follow-up and two patients actually already five years follow-up. So that makes us very happy, uh, Mike, that the fact is that uh, the majority of patients treated with our product remains alive over a long period of time. Mm. Let's take a look at the survival rates that uh, were in the press release uh, for Vidadansil then. Uh, year uh, one year survival of 88 percent three year survival of 71 percent and five year survival of 58 percent how do these results compare to your expectations when heading into the study initially well the outlook for aml patients in this situation was actually dramatically poor it's a devastating disease um, the only real uh, chance for cure for these patients is a bone marrow transplant or where, where your immune system is completely replaced uh, by somebody else's immune system. It's a complicated procedure and it's not available for the majority of patients. So the fact that we now start to see long-term survival in this patient population, uh, the patients that were not scheduled for a transplant and that basically had no other treatment option the moment we started the trial, that was really uh, uh, the most remarkable finding which we have now confirmed. In the meantime, uh, there is a drug approved in this setting, so the maintenance post-chemotherapy. That drug is called uh, Onurec or oral azacitidine. Uh, and that's a very different picture. That's a drug that slows down the growth of the cancer cells. It's not an immunotherapy, it's a chemical treatment. Um, and what you saw there was that the patients that had an MRD positive status after chemotherapy uh, had a median relapse-free survival of seven months. And that compared to only 2.7 months in the untreated group of patients in the registration trial for Onurec. So it's a very different picture. There is an immediate effect, 
right, because the drug slows down the disease. But you don't see this long-term survival in a large group of patients, which we are seeing with immunotherapy. And that, that makes a big difference. Mm. And in comparison to other treatments that are available today for AML patients, how does your results compare? Well, ASA, uh, the oral version of ASA, uh, the drug I just described, is currently the only approved maintenance drug in AML. So there's a lot of uh, drugs, including classical high-intensity chemotherapy, that can treat the immediate disease, right? So when it's diagnosed, you have to treat AML uh, as quickly as possible with high-intensity chemotherapy. Um, that's roughly available for half of the patients. The other half of the patients is today being treated with a new drug called venetoclax. It's combined with azacitidine. Venetoclax is also uh, a very effective drug, but it's also relatively toxic. So also for that patient population, at a certain point, there's a need for maintenance therapy that keeps these patients alive longer. And also very importantly, that does not affect health or quality of life. And then as a last patient population, the transplant patients, uh, the patients that receive a bone marrow transplant or a hematopoietic stem cell transplant, that is a patient population which is basically getting a treatment that could potentially be uh, a curative. But also in transplant, the majority of failures is related to relapse. So also in the transplant setting, there is a need for maintenance therapy. And we could also, for example, treat transplant patients with our product VD Dancel, which is administered as a vaccination, uh, and see if we could uh, have a better outcome of the transplant procedure. So overall, we see a relatively broad uh, patient population in AML that could benefit uh, from our approach, whereas there's now more drugs available to get patients in a first complete remission. Yeah? But for maintenance, we think this is a pretty unique product because of the uh, long-term survival outcomes we see combined with a very good safety profile. Mm. And what is the next steps in the development of uh, Vitadensil? Well, typically you go through different stages in clinical development. Uh, we've now just uh, completed phase two, that's the advanced two data where the patients are now in long-term follow-up. So the logical next thing, if you are successful, which we believe we are on the basis of the current data, is to prepare for a phase three or registration trial. And that means that you set everything up to do uh, one big trial that in the end delivers this kind of data we are now seeing in the phase two, so it will confirm what we see in the phase two, and then you aim for market registration, meaning you can launch your product in the market and basically start selling it to patients all over the world. That's the phase we are currently preparing for. And that is also by far the biggest effort currently in the company because it comes with additional challenges. You have to think about the trial protocol. Uh, once you start the trial, uh, that's it. So you have to think about it carefully and also collect feedback from regulators like the EMA and the FDA in the US to uh, make sure that they are also okay with, with the way you want to approach your trial. Uh, but also very importantly, you need to have the manufacturing in place to not only supply uh, the material for a large trial, but also the same process actually for market launch and commercialization of your product. Because if you don't reach that point and you start changing your manufacturing protocol during phase three, you may end up in trouble because then sometimes regulators say you have to do your trial again, etc. So for us, the most important hurdle to take next to all the trial preparations is make sure that we have large-scale manufacturing ready, meaning GMP, so for use in humans, before we engage in the phase three. So that's really what the next big step will be for the company. Yet parallel to this, you also presented other abstracts in regards to, uh, in regards to Vited N-cell uh, in other patient groups. Can you elaborate a little bit on what your findings were there? Yeah, so the uh, current data and the current results in, uh, in AML and the patient population we described, which is the post-chemotherapy patient population, that is our lead program, right? And so we're super focused on executing on that program and making sure that we are pivotal stage ready, yeah? so ready uh, for a, a phase three trial with everything we just discussed um, in the second half of next year. But the market is much bigger. So what we've done uh, in the first half of this year, we did a quite extensive uh, market analysis uh, with the help of a consultant, but also with the help of key opinion leaders in both Europe and the US. So we did what's called KOL interviews to basically guide the development of the product uh, and also shape up a broader clinical development strategy. 
And that is something that you will next want to support with additional data. So that's, that's the bigger picture, uh, Mike. So on the one hand, we are fully focused on executing on phase three readiness. But at the same time, we are also preparing actually for a broader clinical development strategy that will allow us to also find additional patient populations in the bloodborne tumor space in AML, but also adjacent diseases like chronic myeloid leukemia, for example, that could benefit from this product. Mm. And how should shareholders expect uh, that to look like in practice? Well, it starts with uh, being ready for phase three because that also uh, translates into, let's say, the broader clinical development strategy, right? You want to make sure your product is really ready for late stage clinical development. And for the rest, it will also be a matter of uh, prioritizing different indications next to the, uh, to the registration trial uh, to see what other trials we can engage in. We have already engaged in uh, one additional trial, which is called the AMLM22 Cadence trial. It's a trial that is run by the Australasian Leukemia Lymphoma Group. And that is one example of what you can do as a company to start broadening your clinical development path. So in the Cadence trial, as we call it in short, um, the, the vididensal uh, treatment is already combined with oral azacitidin, so this drug which has now been uh, approved for AML maintenance post-chemo. But also we include a broader patient population. So in our trial, we have included MRD positive patients. So the patients that have an extra high risk of tumor recurrence because of their MRD status. In the Cadence trial, we also include MRD negative patients because a lot of those patients also relapse. So it looks like they don't have disease, but still they relapse. So there's a lot of false negatives, as you call them. It looks like the disease is gone, but it's actually not gone. So already the Cadence trial allows us to broaden the addressable patient population next to delivering the initial data in combination with oral azacitidine. It's a trial run by ALLG, so it's not costing us as a company a lot of money. We're able to open up a lot more clinical centers. Uh, in a part of the world, we had not been doing clinical trials yet in Australia. So we're very happy with that kind of extra efforts we can put in place to not only broaden the addressable patient population, but also to create a bigger clinical trial network and to create more awareness about the product, basically. So that's one example of what we can do also in the future. Mm -hmm. Eric, that was all my questions, but I'll finish the interview by asking you if you have any final thoughts you wish to share. Well, not final thoughts, but just to sum up what we discussed, I think we have a unique opportunity today to develop something meaningful in the hemato-oncology, so in bloodborne tumors, uh, for patients that basically have a very poor prognosis. We're very encouraged, of course, by the data we've just presented at ASH. Uh, and we will do everything uh, within our power to not only prepare the program for uh, phase three, but to also be able to develop it for a greater, broader patient population uh, that is in need of this kind of treatments. Mm. Thank you very much, Erik. Thanks, Mike.